the peacock, the prince of Marbella. Multi-millionaire businessman Manzar Al-Qasar has been tied to three decades of international crime, arms deals, and terror attacks. Qasar is the quintessential Bond bad guy. He's been involved in money laundering, terrorism, weapons trafficking. No matter how you look at it, his weapons resulted in the deaths of lots of people. Watch as a team of undercover operatives infiltrate the multi-billion dollar world of illegal arms dealing to capture on hidden camera never before seen footage of a deadly arms deal going down. Pause it now. Boom. That's the ship that's going to be used to transport the weapons. 18 years in DEA, I'd never seen evidence of this quality. Catch a rare look inside a secret DEA operation to take down an arms kingpin and his empire. Now, inside DEA. On March 27, 2007, two representatives of the Colombian FARC rebels, a terrorist organization known to kill Americans, approached the mansion of Syrian businessman Monzer al qasar in Marbella, Spain. They're here to discuss business, the purchase of $10 million in weapons. What al qasar did not know was that the two FARC members were confidential sources for our agency. They risked their lives by carrying a hidden camera into Kassar's home. The DEA operation is an audacious move that began four years earlier. In 2002, the Drug Enforcement Administration spearheaded the Special Operations Division, an elite multi-agency task force. Because terrorism and arms dealing are often directly tied to drug smuggling, the DEA was given license to pursue a new breed of criminal. The investigation of Qasar is a watershed case. Munzer Mohammed al Qasar, a Syrian national arms trafficker, he first surfaced in DEA investigations back in the 70s as a drug trafficker and then eventually moved into the black and gray arms business. Over the Drug Enforcement Administration has been pursuing Kassar for three decades. He has a record in everything from weapons trafficking to drug trafficking. If you see the people that have acquired weapons from someone like Kassar, and you see people with their hands cut off and their legs cut off, you look at that and say, this guy's got to go. Special Agent Jim Soilis was the first team member on Kassar's trail. The first time I heard his name was in 1984. I was a street agent in New York, and back in them days, New York was a gateway city for heroin. The heroin was coming out of the Middle East, so during the course of our investigations, we arrested a lot of Middle Eastern traffickers. And when they cooperate, they would always mention his name. Munzer al -Kassar. In 1988, the DEA opened a full investigation of Kassar and found that his ties went much deeper than the drug world. There is another hijacking underway tonight in the Middle East. Palestinian guerrillas have taken an Italian cruise ship off the coast of Egypt with about 400 people on board, and they are threatening to blow it up. In October 1985, an Italian cruise liner was pirated by Palestinian terrorists. They rounded up all the passengers, uh, they separated the Americans and Israelis, and an elderly, wheelchair-bound American citizen by the name of Leon Klinghoffer was shot and dumped into the sea. Kassar had set up that operation. In 1994, Kassar stood trial in Spain for his alleged role in financing and facilitating the Achille Loro hijacking. These people have been exposed to the entire world for what they are cold-blooded murderers. It now remains only for justice to be done. I testified at that trial. 
two, many of the witnesses did not show up. According to Spain's El País newspaper, the children of one witness were kidnapped on their way home from school in Madrid and mysteriously returned after several days. No link to Casar was proven. And several of the other witnesses either died, disappeared, or changed their testimony in the middle of the trial. In the end, the prosecution lost their case and Kassar was acquitted. He very publicly declared the trial a charade and a miscarriage of justice. Three years after the acquittal, a witness for the prosecution was gunned down, shot in the head leaving his home. Soilus believed Kassar was to blame. He feared with Kassar free, many more would die. No matter how you look at it, his weapons resulted in the deaths of lots of people. So that was difficult to swallow. The DEA and the Americans, they have something bugging them. Obviously, they are itchy of something. Kassar called the trial a U.S.-backed vendetta and blamed the Drug Enforcement Administration, which to him was one man, Jim Soilis. I was told by the Spanish investigators and several of Kassar's associates that he knew who I was and he kept a file on me. Years later, when Soilis' first child was born, Kassar chillingly sent congratulations. It was a little unnerving knowing that someone of that caliber of a criminal would keep a personal file on me. Bottom line was his way of saying, hey, you're watching me, I'm watching you. Watched but undeterred, Soilus moved on. His career took him from New York to Athens, but the thought of Klinghoffer's death going unpunished haunted him. There was always a piece of me saying, we can't forget about what happened. The acquittal allowed Kassar's arms business to grow and thrive. Sometimes the deals were legal, sometimes not. As conflict sprang up in Nicaragua, Cyprus, Bosnia, Somalia, Iran, and Iraq. Kassar sold weapons to all sides. Then one day, nine years after the Achille Loro trial, Hello, DEA. Soilus received a phone call. In 2003, I got a call asking for me to come to headquarters because some prosecutors from the Department of Justice needed to talk to me. The prosecutors informed Soilus that Abu Abbas, Kassar's associate from the Achille Loro hijacking was now in custody. To build a case against him, they intended to reopen the investigation of Kassar. Acknowledging the work that had gone before, the agents named the new investigation Operation Legacy. By now, you guys have had the opportunity to review the old case file, so you have some idea who uh, Munzel Kassar is. He has phenomenal resources and capabilities. Cargo ships, his own transportation network. Wherever there was a conflict, Munza would show up. He would supply weapons to both sides. Operation Soilus Legacy. briefs a team of DEA agents reinitiating the investigation of Munzer al Kassar. The team was put together from the Special Operations Division. Nick Narji was our logistics guy. He knew how to bring in resources that were needed, uh, resources where other people didn't know existed. Lou Million really understood field operational elements. Reaching out for international partners, putting things in motion. The young guys, John Archer and Wim Brown, phenomenally bright. Computer skills, financial background skills. And Brian Dodd was the group supervisor. A very seasoned investigator. Brian had done a lot of work overseas and they understood how to attack Kassar and his organization in a multi-pronged way. Kassar has residency in Marbella, Spain, and you'll see pictures of his villa there. It is a huge complex. He's got a 20-car garage, clover-shaped pool, servants, bodyguards, priceless art everywhere. The Arabs call him the peacock, and that's because he's always fluffing his feathers out, you know? He's arrogant. And that's his weakness. And as we initiate the new investigation, that's something that we can use to our advantage. This is who he is, the Prince of Marbella, the untouchable. The 
first step of the investigation was to figure out what kind of case could we make, whether it's money laundering, terrorism, weapons trafficking, drug trafficking. What's the easiest way to get in on the guy? Yeah, our perception at the time is that he was very well insulated. And we were really unsure of how much he would actually involve himself directly in the crimes he was committing. Kassar had been looked at by almost every intelligence service and law enforcement agency throughout the world and had never been brought to justice. So all of us knew that we had to come up with something very different in order to bring him down. In order to get him, we're going to have to do a proactive sting against Munzer al Kassar. Step number one, the team needs an undercover operative who can infiltrate Kassar's empire, one with a specific background and plausible motivation. Soilus knew just the man. Call him Samir. Samir was a confidential source that Jim Soilus had developed back in the 80s. He was in Lebanon. He knew weapons. He knew the way these criminal elements worked. I've known him for 26 years. I know his family. That was really, really difficult because you knew you were you were putting them in harm's way. You knew that their lives would change forever. Soilus told Samir to think it over, but his old friend's mind was already made up. He said, no, this is the right thing to do, and I'm willing to do it. Samir's point of entry into Kassar's operation is Tarek Al-Ghazi. Tarek was an old, trusted associate of Kassar's, had been a criminal ally for years. And he was someone that Samir could gain access to, that he would then bring to Kassar. Tarek vouches for Samir and brings Samir into the organization. The investigative team instructed Samir to find Tarek. We were able, from an independent source, to identify he was living in southern Lebanon. Samir arranges a meeting with Tarek and begins the slow process of befriending him. You know, you had to develop a personal relationship first, and that's what he did. Dealing in the Arab culture, you have to be very, very patient, and that was the perfect example. It took months and months of Samir talking with Tarek about nothing before they actually started talking about dealing in weapons. After months of meetings, Samir casually brings up the subject of a large arms deal. His buyers want Kassar to supply the weapons. And Tarek says, why do we need him? I can do it. Samir says, no, we need to do it with Kassar because the buyers know who he is and know that he's capable of providing the weapons that they need. And eventually, Tarek agrees to do it. A location and a time are set for the meeting with Kassar. It will take place in Beirut. Samir risks it all and carries a hidden tape recorder. It was a dangerous situation, especially when you're dealing with a guy like Kassar, who's very wary of meeting strangers. If he smells something funny, it was going to spoil the investigation. Samir's appeal to Kassar's ego appears to have worked. Kassar could have said at that point, I'm a legitimate arms dealer. I don't do this stuff and walk away, you know. Uh, but that didn't happen. The door to a closed world has opened a crack. Now the DEA needs a plausible cover story for an arms deal large enough to hook a very big and cautious fish. We've come up with a scenario utilizing the FARC as our, as our cover. The FARC is a Colombian terrorist organization and a frequent buyer of illegal arms. A little background on the FARC. They are a leftist guerrilla group. They're anti-American. They're heavily involved in drugs. They've got the money, and they would have a real need for the kind of weapons that we think Kassar could provide. The challenge now is to cast the FARC weapons buyers with 100% plausibility. 
any doubt that they are for real will cost these men their lives. One of the reasons I was brought into the team was the, my relationship that I had with a couple of uh, sources, Sensei and, and Carlos. Agent Brown first met the undercover sources while investigating police corruption in Guatemala. I had known Carlos for eight years. He worked for the military and was involved in drug trafficking in uh, Guatemala. He knew what law enforcement needed to get the job done. Sensei was also very intelligent, quick on his feet, but had a wilder side. This is a guy that was actually living in the jungle at times. Carlos and Sensei are to place an order, including nearly 8,000 assault rifles, 120 grenade launchers, and two million rounds of ammunition. They will need fake passports, bank accounts, weapons lists, and cash. Lots of it. Okay, I've checked with our Nicosia country With all the props in place, the team's attention turns to the evidence they will need to convict Kassar. The key to this investigation was obtaining evidence that was indisputable, most likely in the shape of audio and video recordings. Carlos and Sensei will have to do the unthinkable, get past Kassar's security and sneak hidden recording equipment into the Peacock's inner sanctum. But there was never any doubt and Carlos talked about how he had been in that life, a drug transporter, a drug trafficker, and he decided he was going to be on the right side, the justice side. March 27th, 2007. Carlos and Sensei ride a train to the Mediterranean coast. There, a car will meet them and drive them to Casar's villa in Marbella. Samir phones Kassar to confirm that the FARC buyers are on their way to discuss the arms sale. Samir records the conversation. Hello. Problem. Kassar wants to know why they haven't wired payment ahead of time. They seem like amateurs. Samir dodges a bullet. He keeps his cool and assures Kassar that the FARC buyers mean business. They want to discuss particulars but can't over the phone. The meeting is on. The undercover informants arrive in Malaga, where they will be greeted by Kassar's right-hand man. The camera in Carlos's bag is on and rolling. In a hotel room in Barcelona, agents Brian Dodd and Wim Brown wait for news of Carlos and Sensei. We were very concerned about their personal safety. We didn't know if they were going to be searched, what kind of security protocol Kassar may follow. We didn't know what was going to happen. The car pulls into the front gates of Kassar's mansion. get inside without being searched. We knew the Kassar had bodyguards, so our concern was if they got searched before they went into Kassar's estate, they'd be dead in a heartbeat. It 
was a lot of tension because we really felt like this was our shot. If these tapes don't come out, this was it. Entering the house, Carlos Sensei and Samir, and you can see it's every bit as opulent as we imagined it would be. Freeze. It's Monzer. It's Al Kassar. Kassar would never have imagined that somebody would be in there with a recording device. Right. And meeting in his own inner sanctum, and that this was actually occurring was remarkable. Everything was war gamed in advance and choreographed. Esto es un regalo que le trajimos de Guatemala. Edel Ganjagua. Niños, mujeres, les arrancaban el corazón, se los sacaban. Exacto, con cuchillo. We wanted them to discuss the organization that they were from, the FARC, the fact that they make all their money from drug trafficking, the desire to get weapons that would be used to kill Americans, and to let Kassar speak as much as possible. Okay. Vamos a depositar eh, 100 mil euros. ¿Qué es 100 mil euros para un negocio así? Yo te dije que me dijeras cuál. He's really annoyed that they didn't bring more money. He was very agitated with the whole situation. 100 mil euros no es mucho dinero para un negocio de 7 millones de dólares. Nosotros vamos a conseguirle el dinero. Si me da el número de la cuenta, yo puedo entonces hacerle el transfer. Kassar seems to doubt his guests. It's taken four long years to get inside. Could it all be over? Kassar lowers his guard and supplies the wire transfer code to a secure bank account. The deal will go no further until the down payment shows up. Once Kassar receives word that the 100,000 euro down payment is in his account, the deal continues. Kassar is happy, he's, and at this point, he's very much in the teacher mode. This is how we're going to do it. This is the transportation. This is how you do a real deal. <laughs> This is the spec sheet for the surface to air missile. He's pointing out the range, laying everything out about the deal. The most incriminating piece to me was when he pulls out the surface-to-air missile and talks about how it would work against any U.S. helicopter. 18 years of DEA, I'd never seen evidence of this quality. As each piece of paper is handed over, Carlos holds it up in front of the camera, so there's absolutely no doubt as to what it is that Kassar gave him. Pause it now. Go. That's the ship that's going to be used to transport the weapons. 
it's amazing considering the fact how secretive he is, and here he is completely laying it all out for these guys. 100% It's playing into his ego. You're right, he's, he's so busy teaching them, he's not even realizing he's being worked. Kassar lays bare the details of his illegal arms pipeline. Secret bank accounts, routing information, cross-border inspection loopholes. Each document he hands over is another nail in his coffin. March 27, 2007. The undercover operatives conclude arrangements with Kassar for the purchase of 8,000 assault rifles, 120 grenade launchers, and 2 million rounds of ammunition. <laughs> Carlos Sensei and Samir walk out the door of Kassar's mansion with the most incriminating evidence ever captured in Kassar's 30-year criminal career. As soon as I got wheels up on my plane, I pulled out the headphones and my laptop, and I started watching the video. And as it just unfolded, I just I couldn't believe it. The team knows that this case is far from over. Kassar operates in a shadow world of legal and illegal deals and has cooperated with legitimate governments in the past, all of which makes him hard to catch. They want an airtight case. We just needed something to weave it together a bit more tightly. So we crafted an email that was to be sent by Carlos to Kassar. What's the first thing you want to throw out there? We don't want to hit the surface of the air missiles right up front. No. Right? Okay. No. So what do you want Something to hit about first? the product and, and user certificate, there. the diversion of it? Yeah. Final destination yep. for the boat. Right, right. We had a lot of the evidence that we needed to indict, but one of the things that we needed to do was to show that the money that he was going to get was from drug proceeds. OK. You want to say cocaine? <laughs> um, you think? No, no I think it's a product. Product. Okay, product. product. Okay. And it was sugar. Yeah. It was a cover yeah. lot, right? Yeah. Discussing the illegal details of the arms deal in an email is criminal incompetence. Come on, let's or to say surface to air missile? No. Let's just, yeah, let's just put Sam. You can, how many Sams can you provide? And Carlos's boss is very interested. Right, right. And that's going to be great for evidence. If Kassar reacts without denying his involvement, his guilt is implicit. OK, so that was number five. Question, do we throw Monzer's name in here? Uh, no doubt, you think? Yeah, let's, I mean, do it. let's just do it and see what happens and see what his reaction is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I think this was a case for us to really pull the puppet strings. Kassar was someone that had always been in control of everything in his life. And for the first time, we were really going to turn that around on him. At home in Marbella, Kassar receives the email from Carlos. The puppet strings are pulled. Kassar reacts immediately. Hola, amigo, ¿cómo está? Okay, okay. Bueno, no, está bien. No, está bien. No te molestes. Kassar is clearly outraged by the email, but that does not prevent him from fast tracking the illegal deal. Sí, 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 te oigo. Okay, perfecto. Point number five was Kassar's acceptance 
of providing surface-to-air missiles to the FARC. For him to agree to provide something as dangerous as surface-to-air missiles carries a minimum mandatory penalty of 25 years imprisonment. The agents think they have all the evidence they need to convict. The question is, can they catch him? The agents think they have all the evidence they need to convict Kassar, but extradition from Spain, where he has power and influence, will be difficult. So Kassar's been to Romania. It's a place that's comfortable to him. The counterparts are on board. We know that if the, he gets arrested there, they'll all be extradited out of there. And Kassar's off his home turf. Which is, and he's off his home turf, right, which is a problem, obviously, in Spain. Right. The team decides to do the takedown in Romania, where extradition to the U.S. is more likely. It's a big question. Is Kassar really going to show up? When? What's the word with Carlos? Did he put the idea out about Romania? You know, he thought that Monza would be willing to go. What about Tarek and Samir? Do you think there are any issues with trying to get them into? No, In addition to Kassar, the agents plan to arrest co-conspirators Tarek El Ghazi and Felipe Godoy. Arch, Carlos and I will be in Romania, receive all three of these guys, and make the arrest. Yeah, all right. So we're ready at this point. We've got a plan. We do it now and quickly, or it's a real possibility yeah. of losing this guy. Yeah. No, let's just do it. Yeah. The agents arrange for the final payment, nearly $5 million, to be made in cash. Appealing to Kassar's ego, Carlos tells him that his boss will be there and wants to meet the great Monzer al Kassar. The strategy works. All eyes turn to Bucharest. In a hotel room, the agents stand by for the arrest. Seconds become hours as all wait for Kassar to arrive. We really felt like the clock was ticking that we needed to get this done before he walked away. And possibly the last four years of work are just completely down the drain. Then, Carlos receives a phone call. Hello. Hello. Kassar is backing out. Does he smell a rat? Will he escape justice again? The team must come up with a new plan, fast. listo, pero eh, hay un pequeño problema. Eh, mi jefe no quiere dar el resto del dinero hasta que no sepa que está negociando con el verdadero Alcazar. We had Carlos say, listen, we're out of here. My boss and I are flying back to Colombia. He's walking away from the deal. But if you'll meet us in Madrid, a cup of coffee at the airport, this deal is really going to happen. Sí, no, 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 no hay problema. The agents know the offer sounds suspicious, but are betting that Kassar is too invested to walk away now. Okay. Sí, 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 el resto, todo el resto del dinero. Hello? We were tired, end of our rope. We knew we weren't going to be able to keep stringing it along, yeah. that it was time to take the case down. Okay. If this didn't work, we might just be out of options. <laughs> the plan works. Dodd stays in Romania for the arrest of Tarek and Godoy. Archer and Carlos fly to Madrid. At a hotel, 
Agent Brown receives word that Kassar's plane is on its way to Madrid. Let's hit it. Once we knew Kassar was wheels up, it was just incredibly thrilling because we knew that we were going to be taking down someone who had been untouchable for decades. It's almost like a kid at Christmas because you're really excited, you're a little nervous, but it's finally here. We're gonna bring this guy in. It's showtime. At the Madrid airport, all members of the team are in place. After 30 long years of pursuit, the takedown of Manzer Alcazar is imminent. Lou and I had already met with the uh, Spanish National Police and instructed them on who the person was that was going to be arrested. Since the arrest will occur in Spain, the DEA has no jurisdiction and we'll have to rely on the Spanish National Police to bring Casar in. Archer and Carlos land within minutes of Casar's scheduled arrival. Hey, Whip. Hey, we're on the ground. OK, great. Yeah, he just landed gate six. Meet you there. OK. All right, let's keep our eyes open. Make sure we see him before he sees us. Archer takes Carlos to airport operations for the duration of the arrest. If Kassar attempts to leave, Carlos is on hand to lure him back in. All right, just stay by your phone. Are you stop? It's up. It's up. Archer spots Kassar walking with two associates. Hey, we've got him. He's through the gate. He's on his way to baggage claim. All right, heading down there now. For the first time, the agents get a look at Kassar in the flesh. It was really something to see someone that we had been tracking for so long standing right in front of us. For once, he was uh, the lamb in the lion's den. Kassar through the busy airport, eager to keep him within their grasp. The Spanish National Police was just awaiting Kassar to get his bags in baggage claim. get in position to witness the arrest. You got him right? Yeah, I see him. Right there. So we're just watching him, and the Spanish counterparts are fanned out at different locations, ready to go in and make the arrest. Brown calls Agent Dodd in Bucharest. Brian, swim. Yeah, he's here. Yep, Mondra's here. We're at, we're at the baggage claim. SMP's about ready to make the move. I was talking to him on the phone, and I stood out in the hallway of the Romanian border police, and he just described the whole scene to me. It still gives me a, a chills, actually, when, when, you know, retelling it. Yeah, we got eyes on him right now. Spanish National Police are getting ready to move in. And suddenly, uh, Kassar abruptly left. Where'd he go? I don't know. He disappeared. Did someone tip him off? I don't see him. Does he sense a trap? Is it possible they could get so close and lose him again? Oh God. It was like your gut falling out. We're looking at the Spanish National Police guys, and they're all got their hands up in the air, and we're like, oh my God, this guy's gone. Ah, uh, John. And we're like, if he hits the street, he may just disappear into thin air, and Madrid will never know where he is. Where'd he go? This is crazy. And then all of a sudden, Casaro walked out of the bathroom. There he is. Okay. Yeah. All right, all right, he's back. He eventually came back to the baggage claim. And then they were ready to make the arrest. 
a Spanish national policeman approaches Kassar. And he says, well, you know, what is this about? So they tell him about the warrant. Kassar endures the inconvenience, but does he understand the magnitude of the case against him? That's it. That's it. See, and the Spanish National Police cops grab him, put their hands on him. What a great feeling. There was a tremendous sense of accomplishment. There was a sense of justice. And then we knew also that Felipe and Tarek were in custody in Romania. So it was incredibly exciting. It's awesome. We succeeded. But in the back of your mind, you knew that the tough part is going to be him getting extradited back to the United States. Now the hard part's coming up. Kassar is taken to a holding cell in Madrid where he will await an extradition hearing for trial in the United States. But this criminal mastermind has avoided the DEA before. Will he slip through their grasp this time? Good morning. I'm here today with Karen Tandy, the administrator of the Drug Enforcement Administration, to announce the arrests of international arms dealer Manzar al Qasar and two of his criminal associates on charges of terrorism and arms trafficking. Yesterday, the Spanish National Police arrested Qasar at the Madrid International Airport. Simultaneously, the Romanian Border Police arrested Ghazi and Moreno in Bucharest, Romania. This morning, the Spanish authorities executed a search warrant on Casar's Marbella, Spain estate. Yesterday's arrest marked the culmination of a long-term DEA undercover investigation that spanned the globe and finally brought one of the world's most prolific arms traffickers to justice. The Justice Department begins the process of extraditing Casar from Spain for trial in the U.S. Kassar's legal team is confident that the Spanish, under no circumstances, will turn him over to the Americans. The DEA stands by. It was really hard to concentrate on anything else, knowing that they were going to come out with the verdict. After reviewing the evidence, the Spanish court rules in favor of Kassar's extradition to the U.S. <laughs> I was the person that took custody of Munzer al Kassar. And when he got off the helicopter, the sun was kind of in his face. And we were all standing there with our DEA jackets. And, and he, I saw him squint. And when he realized that he was going to be handed over to us, his lip quivered. And that was the first sign of emotion I saw him. You couldn't quite relax. You couldn't quite let yourself enjoy the moment until it was wheels up and we were off the ground heading back. On November 2nd, 2008, Manzer al Qasar was charged with five crimes by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. At trial, the defense claimed Kassar was working with Spanish intelligence to capture the FARC members as part of a double sting operation. The jury didn't buy it. Kassar was quickly convicted on all five counts and sentenced to 30 years at a South Carolina federal penitentiary. You look at someone like Kassar and you think of the countless weapons that he's provided and you see what evil's done. That's a satisfying thing to know that, hey, you were able to take some of these weapons off the street. It sends a clear message that you can run, but you can't hide. This terrorist is finally going to be put away for 30 years, and he won't be able to plan and plot any more murders. Samir testified against Kassar and considers it the crowning achievement in his 25-year career as a DEA confidential source.
Carlos continued his work with the DEA, reprising his role as a FARC weapons buyer in several high-profile operations. After Kassar's arrest, Sensei and Carlos's identities were leaked to the press by an unknown source. Against the DEA's advice, Sensei returned home to Guatemala. You know, we always told Sensei, you need to get out of Guatemala because it's not safe. But that was his home. That's where he felt most comfortable. Several months after the conclusion of Operation Legacy, Sensei was gunned down in the street. His murder remains unsolved. To this day, Kassar sits in a U.S. prison cell where he denied a request to be interviewed for this film. He maintains his innocence and is appealing his conviction. The sting that netted Kassar has become a model for other successful operations around the world. But in these turbulent times, there is no shortage of buyers of illegal arms. So there will always be another Kassar standing by to sell weapons for a price.